So I was born in Washington, D.C., and from the day I was born, I was surrounded by people from all over the world. Had I been old enough, I could have walked from Senegal to Sweden, sort of. And before the age of two, my parents moved here. Upstate New York. This is a town of Fonda, a town of about 800 people, of which 98% are white. It was rural, it was secluded, it was safe, and Fonda was the kind of place you um, knew everyone, uh, all your neighbors, more or less every, everyone in town, and it is here I spent most of my childhood. My mother was an elementary school teacher or, uh, at a public school, which was essentially around the corner from my house, and my father worked for the Department of Agriculture. Uh, this was part of the federal government, and he assisted farmers in getting for livestock, equipment, and land. As a kid, the most exciting thing that happened in Fonda was the Fonda Fair. We had tractor pull, plenty of cows, and carnival rides. Most of our newspapers and television, uh, television news pretty much consisted of things that happened within a 50-mile radius of our town. Looking back on my childhood, I can only recall a couple of international stories that made our newspapers. Uh, we had presidential elections and I think as a child, probably all I remembered was the fall of the Berlin Wall and a Lockerbie bombing. This type of news coverage was common in small town America when I was a kid. Things that happened to you and your community were important. Things that happened outside of your community weren't discussed. Growing up, my family took trips up and down the east coast of America, once across the border to nearby Canada, and once a beach holiday to Mexico. But the place I wanted to travel to most was New York City, uh, which was four hours from my hometown. So 800 people in my hometown, New York City four hours away. New York City fascinated me as a kid. My first trip there was when I was eight years old. They were usually just quick day trips back. I felt this thrill every time I went. Massive, it was crowded, it was dirty, it was dangerous, but I liked it because it was different. So at age 23, I moved there. And when I say there, I mean the heart of New York City, Times Square. And in New York City, I started to feel my boundaries widen. I tried strange and exotic foods like sushi and Indian cuisine. But for the most part, I was surrounded by people who looked like me and thought like me. Soon, a British friend who had been on assignment in America invited me to visit him in London. So in the year 2000, I applied for my first passport. I was age 24. I skipped ahead. Lund um, when I was growing up, traveling abroad wasn't something that I had aspired to do. London, like New York, was different than anything I had ever seen in the world. I was instantly bitten by the travel bug. It was just the idea of seeing and experiencing something new. Then I started traveling for work to Asia. And why these new places intrigued me, they were very different than anything in my life. Trips abroad were compartmentalized experiences. I would travel abroad, have an experience, come back to my everyday life, and the two never intersected. I was basically ticking off travel to-do lists, taking your obligatory fo uh, tourist photos in front of famous landmarks, filling your suitcase with cheap knickknacks without understanding what it meant to live in that country, or to be from a place other than my own. Then I saw this play in 2004. It was called Nothing But The Truth, written by and starring Dr. John Connie. It was put on at Lincoln Center in New York. When I walked into the theater, I knew absolutely nothing about South Africa. I knew nothing about apartheid. I knew nothing about truth and reconciliation. However, unlike some American, uh, recent American politicians, I did know that Africa was a continent and South Africa its own country. The beauty of theater in general, and this play in particular, is the ability to open your mind and touch your heart through storytelling. During this play, I was confronted with an entirely new history. How could something as monumental as the first free elections in South Africa and the TRC have gone on when I was in university, yet I knew nothing of it? I walked out of the theater with my first educational series decided on as I ran a production company, I would go to South Africa. Mind you, I've never been to the continent, know nothing about it. As I got closer to the production, I was doing research, I started to become a little uneasy. 
how would I be perceived as a young white American filmmaker coming to tell the history of this country? I was worried that people wouldn't be open to discussing their past with me. But in South Africa, everyone was open and eager to share their stories. I was welcomed into schools, into homes, into businesses, and in some cases, into people's lives. I shared meals, long hours, and stories with some of the most fascinating people on the planet. This had never happened to me as a tourist. And it was through these stories that I started to see what it meant to live here, to be South African. I began to focus less on our differences and more of what we share as human beings. And I began to see that everyone on the planet is pretty much seeking the same basic things. Happiness, health, to provide for the ones we love. And while we all come from different places and grow up with unique influences, we have far more in common than we might think. I began to see how each one of us is a global citizen. Now this idea of global citizenship is one that I had when I was starting my film company. It seemed like a great buzz term, global citizen. No one was talking about it and it made my NGO's organization stand out. But even in writing it down, I didn't understand what it meant. So I was, I was planning my first trip to South Africa and I decided to hire a local guide. And the guide we got assigned was a bush expert. And he knew very little about the history of Johannesburg, the way people interacted, and what the majority of historic events meant to the people of this country. I needed someone who could speak the language of black South Africa, both literally and metaphorically. So after a small disagreement with the tour company, I got assigned a young man named Mta, who had lived through most of the events that I wanted to cover in my film series here. Now, Mta gave me daily lessons in both Zulu and Xhosa, <laughs> which immediately helps people connect with my crew and I. It was a simple gesture, but it shared I cared enough about where I was to try to interact a little more like a local. Now, speaking a local language was something I had never been taught to do as a tourist. But perhaps the most enlightening experience I had in South Africa was when Mta took me to visit two schools. Adults are often afraid of looking foolish or uninformed. Kids just don't have that filter and will ask whatever is on their minds. So in visiting these two schools in Johannesburg, I was asked everything from, are you a fair or unfair boss? Do you know Hollywood movie stars? And even, I've seen incidences of random violence on the news relating to America. Why is that? Just as Americans have this preconceived notion of a racially divided and violent South Africa, the students I met in Johannesburg viewed America through the lens of news programming, Hollywood blockbusters, and pop culture. So I took a cue from these kids. I stopped being afraid as a tourist, as a traveler, to ask questions. I started asking all kinds of questions of the adults I met. And in doing so, started to engage in topics, uh, in conversation on big topics. Everyone in America tells you don't engage, uh, don't have a conversation about politics or religion, it's too polarizing. But I found when I was traveling abroad, as long as it was from a point of learning, no topic was off limits. Because I was open to having these conversations, I was able to show an authentic reflection of life in South Africa. What I did here, through my film series, was to just ask questions and let the people of South Africa tell their own history. Rather than making films about what I thought was important as an outsider, I simply asked, what are you most proud of? What are the biggest challenges you face? What should the rest of the world know about you and your country? So I took this concept of question asking to the Middle East for another film series I was doing, where no one wants to talk about gender equality or religion. By asking simple questions, I learned about women's roles in Jordanian society and how that's changing. And I learned about Islam in everyday life. And I got to take these messages back to students in America. Jordan isn't really a place for terrorism. That's what I want them to know. Everybody thinks that if you're in the Middle East, that's, that's got 
that's got to have something to do with terrorism. I have a friend that she was from Yemen, and she was really cool and everything. She told me a little bit about it, but it's true. Like, I wish I did know more about it than just, oh, there's a war over there. I would definitely want to think that, or know that Jordan's a really safe country. It's not um, how the world kind of knows it as. I mean, people think it's a dangerous place and stuff. It's not. <laughs> So following Jordan, I went to Haiti, um, and I filmed at a hospital there. Um, this is post the 2010 earthquake. And post the earthquake, some surgeons were estimating that more than 200,000 Haitians are going to need amputations. And in Haiti, losing a limb carries a social stigma. Shortly after the earthquake, international aid organizations began shipping donated prosthetics. And these first artificial limbs that arrived were in skin tones matching those of white people. I tried to explain this to my white friends. I asked the ticket them to consider, imagine the nearly unimaginable trauma of losing a limb in a society that view amputees as a whole person. Now imagine as a white person being given an artificial limb in a black skin tone. This is one example of what happens when we don't ask questions, don't engage in cross-cultural dialogue. What is apparent on the surface is not the solution it may seem. Having traveled to nearly 40 countries and worked with hundreds of people all over the world, it is my belief we may need more dialogue, especially more cross-cultural conversation, and to ask more questions to better understand one another. Project Explore, my film company, was one of the first tools created for uh, dialogues to tools to create dialogues across cultures for young people. Through my global film series, we reach about 5 million students a year, but in the grand scheme of things, that's not a lot. See, there was a bottleneck in my film work. These global stories were being held back by how fast I could travel, come back, and edit. And even when I, when I completed a film series, the few questions I could provide usually just led to more questions. So I started using so social media. And I found that people both young and old had all these questions that weren't getting a uh, answered in traditional media. And they wanted to engage in a more direct dialogue. In around 2008, 2009, everyone was getting involved in Facebook. Um, when I was in Amman, Jordan filming, I had a taxi driver who spoke very little English but was quick to ask if he could be my friend on Facebook. By 2010, people get, were getting more familiar with these tools and I noticed an evolution in how this medium was being used. I would share a video or start a conversation on Facebook or Twitter, and rather than relaying each other's sides, I would just pose the question, pose the topic, and let the conversation happen. People who didn't have a voice in a global discussion before, like my tax mom, are just now beginning to find their voice through social media. Look at the uprisings in the Middle East and Northern Africa. These revolutions were organized by savvy social media users. The world watched these events unfold via Facebook and Twitter. We were able to ask questions without the mediation of news channels. Mobile phones make social media even, uh, even more powerful. A wealth of information is available at everyone's fingertips all the time. Anyone can be a reporter, anyone can be a publisher, and in turn, anyone can ask their own questions. So what are people talking about in social media? Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, had this to say. A squirrel dying in front of your house may be more relevant to your interests right now than people dying in Africa. I don't think this is true. Based on my experience, people are just now learning how to ask the questions that were once off limits. And we're just now, as a global society, learning how to seek the answers to those questions. Social media is helping us get away from that us versus them mentality. Through social media, people are instantly aware of what's going on in the world. And we're beginning to realize that our problems are global in nature. We are beginning to see what, we, what happens far away affects us directly, personally, and viscerally. And we're also seeing that our actions can have an impact on a global scale. 
for the first time in history, we're acting like global citizens in a global society. Inevitably, the way these technologies and the way they're being used means we're becoming global citizens first and national citizens second. To me, being a global citizen means celebrating our common humanity while respecting the diff uh, different path another group or culture may take. And you can't really do either of those things if you don't take the time to learn what those commonalities are. And unlike where I'm from, ignorance is no longer an excuse because the information you need is in front of your face all the time. Some fight against this idea and claim that they are only citizens of the government under which they live. And in a very narrow way, this is true. We don't all get passports from the UN or some other global entity. But unlike being a citizen of a nation, being a global citizen gives us all the same rights and obligations at birth. You can't opt out of humanity. You can't choose to not be a member of the human race. What does it mean to me to be a good global citizen? Uh, I would say for myself, it's challenging myself to be aware of what's going on outside of my normal boundaries. You know, uh, to be aware of what's happening with my neighbor. And not necessarily my neighbor who lives next to me in California, but my neighbor in terms of neighbors in other states, neighbors in other countries, uh, neighbors in other continents. Just keep, to, to, just trying to every day be aware of something that's going on outside of my normal way of life. I think uh, being a good global citizen um, means waking up to the fact that we are all part of a much larger process, an evolving process, and that those of us that are privileged enough even to be having this conversation or watching this now are actually in a position to move that process forward. And a big part of that is actually realizing the fact that we are interconnected. The world is getting flatter and smaller every single day and we have much more in common with people living in a tiny little village in northern China than either they real realize or we realize. A lot of issues that we're all dealing with today in America are global issues um, and we're all connected with the internet, with Facebook, with everything. I think it's very important today with the information that we can have about what's going on in the world. Uh, to be active, to make our world a better world. Communicate. Ask questions. Who are you? Where are you from? What do you value? What do you think we could do better? And answer those same questions to yourself and to the people that you meet. Communicate. Listen. Answer the questions. Keep asking. Keep answering. Communicate. So, as global citizens, as members of humanity, it is your mission to bring your ideas and questions forward and to listen to the ideas and questions of others. Be part of this global dialogue, communicate, challenge your prejudices, and be open. Thank you.